This lecture is the acid-base lecture. The basic objectives for this lecture is based on pathophysiology to be able to identify whether a patient is in metabolic acidosis, metabolic alkalosis, respiratory acidosis, or respiratory alkalosis, and to be able to interpret a patient's acid-base imbalance from a sample of arterial blood gas or ABG values and to determine whether or not the patient is fully compensated, partially compensated, or uncompensated. When we look at acid-base balance, it's maintained by controlling the hydrogen ion concentration. Now remember, the concentration of hydrogen ions is equal to what the body's pH is. And pH is inversely proportional to the number of hydrogen ions. So if you have an increase in hydrogen ions, then you will have a decrease in pH. The concentration of hydrogen ions in body fluids has the narrowest range of normal and is very tightly regulated by the body. Relatively small changes in the pH for short periods of time can disrupt major life-sustaining physiologic processes. A slight increase in hydrogen ions causes proteins such as hormones and enzymes to be denatured, changing their configurations and rendering them inactive. When we look a little closer at pH, the normal blood pH ranges from 7.35 to 7.45. Remember, 7.4 is neutral, therefore the body is slightly basic. For purposes of this lecture, normal is going to be abbreviated as AABB, meaning there is a balance between acid A and base B. So acidosis is when the pH drops below 7.35, and this is usually due to an excess of hydrogen ions. Alkalosis is when the pH is over 7.45, and it's because of a deficit of ions. Remember, a pH below 6.8 or above 7.8 is fatal for the patient as it's inconsistent with compatibility for life. So let's look at arterial blood gases. Blood gas measurements are the major diagnostic tool for evaluating acid-base imbalances. The ABG measurement that we're going to look at are several parameters. We have the pH, which is the concentration of hydrogen ions, the PCO2, which is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, the HCO3, which is your bicarbonate concentration, your PO2, which is your partial pressure of oxygen, and ox uh, SAO2, which is your oxygen saturation. You also have a base excess, which is the amount of bases, but these five components, once you get these down, you should be able to fairly accurately determine what an ABG is telling you. So the PO2 and SAO2 levels are secondary parameters when you're assessing acid-base balance. These levels do not directly determine acid-base disorders, but rather provide information that may assist in determining the underlying cause. Remember your partial pressure, PO2, less than 80 millimeters of mercury, indicates hypoxemia an SAO2 of less than 95% indicates a decrease in hemoglobin saturation with oxygen. So let's look at the normal AG, ABG values. These are something you need to know. A pH, the normal is 7.35 to 7.45. So if you'll notice on this, there is an A right before the 7.35 and indicating that is the acid end and a B after the 7.45, indicating that that is the base range. So if you go below 7.35, the patient is becoming more acidic. If you go above the 7.45, they're becoming more basic. So the PCO2, the ranges are 35, the base in, to 45, the acid in. The bicarb is 22, the acid end, to 26, the base end. And as you recall, your PO2 is 80 to 100, and your SAO2 is 95 to 100%. 
Now one quick thing that you can help to determine to whether or not they're in a metabolic or a respiratory situation is determining whether or not the pH and the pCO2 are they going the same direction. So if the pH is going in the same direction as the CO2 then that is a respiratory situation. For example, an elevated pH and an elevated CO2 indicates that you have a respiratory cause for that change. If the pH and the CO2 are going opposite of each other, then it's metabolic. For example, if you have an elevated pH but a decreased CO2, you have a metabolic cause for your problem. We will cover that a little bit more in lecture. If there is any confusion on that. We'll review it again. So you have regulatory mechanisms that are used to help maintain pH control. And we're going to talk about each one of these. It is the chemical buffer systems, the respiratory system regulation, and the renal system for regulation. When we look at the cellular buffers, these are buffers that are substances in the extracellular fluid that can absorb excessive hydrogen ions without a significant change in the pH. So buffers maintain the body's pH within that normal of 7.35 to 7.45. A hemoglobin is a major protein buffer and also albumins and globulins are a major buffer. The most important buffer system is the bicarb carbonic acid buffer. This maintains the acid-base balance about 55% of the time. Concentration of oxygen and hydrogen ions are directly related. They are in constant movement to equalize. An increase in one will usually result in a decrease in the other and vice versa. For example, if you have an increase in hydrogen, excuse me, if you have CO2 retention and we're heading that way, you're going to have an increase in hydrogen. If you have a blowing off of CO2, then you're going to have a decrease in hydrogen. So this formula works back and forth to help maintain the acid-base balance. In the respiratory system, the lungs are going to regulate the hydrogen ion concentration and therefore the pH. So that is done by blowing off carbon dioxide as in, in hyperventilation or retaining carbon dioxide as in hypoventilation. The lungs will try to compensate. So how do you think oxygen concentration will affect the acid-base balance? If you decrease oxygen, you wind up increasing the CO2. So the respiratory effects that you can have here are the excessive carbonic acid is reduced in the lungs to water and carbon dioxide that is eliminated during breathing. And the body will respond by either speeding up and deepening the breaths or making them more shallow and slowing them down. So in the respiratory system, the lungs are the first line of defense. You can have metabolic or respiratory disturbances that throw off the acid-base balance. The lungs can compensate for the metabolic disturbances. So let's look at metabolic alkalosis. In this situation, in order to compensate, the lungs are going to retain CO2. They're going to hypoventilate. So the CO2 is going to rise over 45 and it's going to produce more hydrogen. That acid will then help to offset the metabolic alkalosis. For metabolic acidosis, the lungs are going to blow off CO2 in hyperventilation. By doing that, it's hoping to reduce the CO2 to less than 35, getting rid of hydrogen, and therefore balancing the acid. The lungs are much more sensitive and can begin compensating within seconds to minutes for an excess or deficit of hydrogen ions. However, the lungs can be very easily overwhelmed if this continues to increase. You also have the renal system. Now the kidneys can usually maintain a 20 to 1 
20 to 1 ratio of bicarbonate to carbonic acid. That's why the body is slightly alkali at 7.4. Bicarbonate is the principal buffer base. The kidneys will absorb, excrete, and synthesize bicarb in order to try to balance out the acid-base system. The kidneys can compensate for respiratory disturbances, and they're going to compensate for respiratory imbalances by excreting, synthesizing, and retaining both hydrogen ions and bicarb ions. So if we have respiratory alkalosis that is occurring, to compensate for that, the kidneys are going to excrete bicarb and reabsorb hydrogen. So the bicarb is going to drop below 22, which is going to eliminate bicarb and help it make the body more acidic to offset the alkalosis. If they have respiratory acidosis, the kidneys are going to retain bicarb and excrete hydrogen ions to help compensate for that acidosis. Therefore, you will see bicarb rise over 26 as it's being retained to offset the acidosis. It's a very powerful compensation mechanism and it can result in dramatic changes. However, the problem with the renal system is it can take hours to days to fully activate. So when we look at potassium imbalances, cells will exchange potassium for hydrogen in order to help try to maintain extracellular fluid homeostasis. The problem with this is that when the cells exchange the, the potassium for the hydrogen, hyperkalemia can result from this. So as the imbalance is corrected and the hydrogen ions return to the bloodstream, you have to watch your patient because as the potassium returns into the cells, we can then go from a state of hyperkalemia to a state of hypokalemia. With renal buffering, the kidneys will not only excrete electrolytes, but they will also bind them, making them unavailable to use for anything else. So with phosphate, the acid excess, the hydrogen will, or in a situation of acid excess, the hydrogen will combine with phosphate, HPO4, and excrete it as H2PO4. If ammonia is the part of the problem, if we're in an acid excess situation, the hydrogen combines with the ammonia, ammonia, NH3, and excretes it as ammonium, NH4, and bicarb is generated from there. If we have an acid deficit, the hydrogen is removed from the NH4 and reabsorbed by the kidney, and that is going to help keep things in balance. Now in the situation of acidemia in your patient, we have too many hydrogen ions in the blood and a pH that is lower than normal. So our pH is less than 7.35. So if we go back, remember we were saying that in normal, that was going to be AABB for the purposes of this lecture. So in an acid excess, we have more A than we have on the other side, it's not balanced. So that's the equivalent of having an AAABB, too much acid. For a base deficit, we're missing a B, so it's AAB, and then nothing else as you're looking at that. So you can have too much or too little. In alkalemia, it's the other way. Our pH is greater than 7.45. We have a decrease in the hydrogen ion concentration, and our pH is higher than normal. So we have an excess of base in this situation when we compare it to normal, or AABBB. If we have an acid deficit that's causing the alkalemia, we're missing acid. So we only have an ABB. So let's take a look at the categories of acid-base imbalances. So there's four categories that we're eventually going to look at, and those are listed in the beginning, respiratory acidosis and respiratory alkalosis, and metabolic acidosis and metabolic alkalosis. Now, when we're looking at them and comparing them to AG, ABGs, we're also looking at levels of compensation. Is this 
individual uncompensated, partially, fully, or mixed. Now we will not cover the mixed, that's a little bit more complex, however you need to understand it's out there. So in an individual who has uncompensated, also known as primary acid base imbalance, the uncompensated imbalances are originating from an acute condition and the body has not mobilized enough yet to start to try to balance it out. With partial let me go back to the uncompensated for a second. When we're looking at uncompensated, we're going to have one of the lab values, whether it's carbon dioxide or bicarb, that is going to still be within the normal limits because it has not started shifting. In partially compensated, all three values, the pH, the bicarb, and the CO2, are all out of normal range. And when we look at fully compensated, we've gone from the partially compensated where the body is in, in, in the attempt of trying to bring the pH back to normal to fully compensated where the body's attempt has been able to bring it back to normal. So here you may have an abnormal CO2 and an abnormal bicarb, but your pH is within the normal limits. And that is your key that is fully compensated, is that even though the other two are out of the normal ranges, your pH is within normal range. So with the mixed, the one that we're not going to cover, that indicates that you have both a respiratory and a metabolic imbalance occurring at the same time. Right now, for purposes of this lecture, I just want you to be able to identify a basic imbalance before we head to ever getting into a mixed balance. Again, this is a pH going over uncompensated. Your pH is going to be abnormal. It's going to be under 7.35 or over 7.45. There's no evidence of compensation yet that is occurring in partially compensated. The pH is abnormal and both your um, system of origin is abnormal and the compensatory mechanism is, a, is abnormal. And with fully compensated, again, your pH is back within the normal range of 7.35 to 7.45, even though the lab values look abnormal for the other two um, indicators, but it shows that the body has been able to bring the balance back within normal limits. So we have the four imbalances, and let's look at each one of these. It's respiratory acidosis, respiratory alkalosis, metabolic acidosis, and metabolic alkalosis. With respiratory acidosis, the definition is this is a failure of the respiratory system to remove carbon dioxide as fast as it's produced. The pathophysiology pathophysiological cause is usually hypoventilation and this results in an increased CO2 which leads to a decrease in hydrogen or excuse me a decrease in pH. So some cause of, the, of that can be disorders such as lung disorders, um, COPD, asthma, pneumonia, pulmonary edema, ARDS. These are all diseases and situations which would impede the ability of the body to exchange gases across the permeable membrane. You can have airway obstruction such as a mucus plug, atelectasis, or a foreign body aspiration. You can have respiratory depression from general anesthesia, a narcotic overdose, or head trauma. Or you can simply have inadequate lug expansion due to skeletal deformities from trauma or a pneumothorax um, or ascites. So as acidosis increases, there's a progressive skeletal muscle weakness, which is going to, again, decrease the ability of the lungs to open. And as the weakness increases, it can lead to severe respiratory insufficiency. So some signs and symptoms that you're going to see of respiratory acidosis is head headache due to cerebral vasodilatation, tachycardia due to the hypercapnia. Now the tachycardia is usually initially in the beginning. You're going to see bradycardia due to increased potassium levels, uh, especially as it becomes severe. 
and then as it continues you'll see cardiac arrhythmias due to the decreased myocardial cell pH and hyperkalemia occurring. You'll see CNS depression, confusion to coma will occur as carbon dioxide crosses the blood brain barrier very easily and you will see neuromuscular weakness such as hyporeflexia, flaccid paralysis and that is usually due to the hyperkalemia which is occurring. The way we're going to manage respiratory acidosis is we're going to provide vent adequate ventilation. We're going to try to facilitate blowing off the CO2 as much as possible. We also want to provide adequate hydration. This can be up to two to three liters a day and that's to help facilitate secretion removal. We want to give bronchodilators to help reduce bronchial spasms. We're going to provide supplemental oxygen to help increase oxygenation. And we're going to have this patient turn, cough, and deep breathe to mobilize and remove those secretions and help improve collateral circulation. So if we were to take a look at uncompensated respiratory acidosis, if we were looking at an ABG, what would that look like? Our pH is going to be below 7.35. That is an acid. Our CO2 levels are going to be elevated. That is an acid. It's over 45. But our bicarb levels are still within the normal range of 22 to 26. So you may also see an elevated serum potassium over 4.5 and your decreased PO2. Now as the body is mobilizing and trying to balance this imbalance, it's going to move into a partially compensated situation. In this situation, the pH is still below 7.45. Our CO2 levels are still over 45 because this is a resp respiratory initiated problem, but our bicarb levels are now going to start rising over 26 to try to balance that increase in CO2. As the body is able to bring it back into full compensation, our pH returns to normal. However, it may still be on the acidic side, so it may be somewhere between 7.39 to 7.5. 3.5, somewhere in there. It's within normal and on the acidic side. We're still going to see those elevated CO2 levels because that was causing our problem, and we're going to see the bicarb levels over 26 because it is balancing it out. Now the opposite, respiratory alkalosis, is a loss of carbon dioxide faster than the body can produce. So the pathophysiological cause of this is usually hyperventilation and that results in low CO2 resulting in an elevated pH. So items that can cause this are anxiety, pain or high hypoxia due to epinephrine release, a stimulated respiratory center and that can be from fever, aspirin overdose, brain trauma or a tumor um, due to direct stimulation of central chemoreceptors. Or you can, your patient can be having a gram-negative septicemia due to septic shock and this is in the early phase of septic shock. Signs and symptoms that we're going to see that indicate respiratory alkalosis. Your patient is going to complain of dizziness due to cerebral vasoconstriction, numbness and tingling in the fingers and around the mouth. Your patient may have a positive Schaffstex or a Trousseau sign related to the inhibition of the calcium ionization. And we may see cardiac arrhythmias due to decreased potassium and calcium. The way we're going to manage this respiratory alkalosis is we're going to have the patient breathe into a paper bag to help rebreathe some of the CO2 to help elevate the CO2. We're going to give oxygen by mask once when we determine the underlying cause if it is due to hypoxemia and we may give calcium gluconate intravenously if we have to counteract tetany. These individuals, when you're looking at the ABGs, you'll, to determine that it is an uncompensated situation, you're 
arterial pH is going to be over 7.45, which is basic. You will have a decreased level of CO2, which is less than 35 and your bicarb will be normal. It has not started to move one way or the other yet. If you look at your serum potassium, it is usually decreased less than 3.5. As the body moves into a partially compensation, your arterial pH is still going to look high, over 7.45. You're still going to have a low CO2 level, less than 35 and you're now going to start seeing decreased bicarb levels less than 22 as the body tries to make this more acidic to help offset the extra base. Once the body has moved into full compensation, this is where you're going to see the pH return to normal, but it is going to be on the basic side. So it's going to be more along the lines of 7.41 to 7.45. You're going to see decreased CO2 levels because that was what was creating the problem. This was respiratory alkalosis. And your bicarb levels are going to be lower as it tries to balance out that loss in carbon dioxide. So let's look at metabolic acidosis. The definition here is excess acid production except for carbonic acid or an excess loss or underproduction of base. So we've either got too much acid or not enough base. The pathophysiology of metabolic acidosis, if we have excess metabolic acids, that could cause it. Usually it's from excess ketones, as in diabetic ketone acidosis ketoacidosis. You can have lactic acidosis from shock. You can have renal failure due to tubular necrosis, so the body is not able to eliminate the extra acid. You can have an ex increased metabolic rate with heavy exercise, seizure activity, or a fever. Or you can just have ingestion of an acidic substance such as poisoning uh, with ethanol, methanol, ethylene glycol, and aspirin. You can have metabolic acidosis as a result of excess loss of base, such as in severe diarrhea. Or you can simply have it as a result of underproduction of base, which is usually decreased pancreatic function with chronic pancreatitis, where the pancreas normally secretes bicarb, which functions to neutralize the contents in the duodenum and that is then reabsorbed in the GI tract, but it's not happening. Or you have a blocked common bile duct, which is not allowing the secretion into the GI system for absorption. So signs and symptoms that your patient is in metabolic acidosis, the skin is going to be warm and flushed from peripheral vasodilatation. You're going to see cardiac arrhythmias due to reduction in cardiac contractility and inotropic response to catecholamines. Your patient may be anywhere from lethargic to coma due to the fall in pH in the cerebral spinal fluid and the brain does not respond very well to that. You're going to see a decreased pulse due to decreased cardiac output. And again, due to decreased cardiac output, you'll see decreased blood pressure. And you can see dehydration if it's due to GI losses. So the way that we're going to manage metabolic acidosis, and the most important thing is this, we need to treat the underlying disorder. If it's diabetic ketoacidosis, we're going to give them insulin and fluids. If it's an alcohol-related ketoacidosis, we're going to give them glucose and saline. If we have diarrhea, we need to correct the fluid and electrolyte imbalances and stop the diarrhea if possible. A patient with acute renal failure will usually be put on dialysis. And if it's a result of lactic acidosis, we want to correct the hypoxia and or the hypoperfusion to help prevent that. We're going to administer sodium bicarbonate IV when the, when the pH is less than 7.2. We may give potassium replacement because the hydrogen ions have been moving in order to try to move them into the cell. We've been um, losing that. We have to be very careful of the uh, shifting of the potassium 
because when the acidosis is corrected, the potassium is going to go back into the cell and we're going to have hypokalemia. So that's when we're going to be aware of the potassium replacement needs. And we may have to put this patient on mechanical ventilation so that we can do some compensatory hyperventilation if the patient is not able to breathe very well and the hypoventilation is what is causing the acidosis. So when we look at the uncompensated, partially, or fully compensated, the respiratory rate in the beginning with acidosis, the lungs will try to compensate for this, and in the beginning, the respiratory rate will increase within minutes. And so partial compensation is going to begin immediately, and full compensation is going to take several hours. So when we see our patient and we have the ABGs, we can tell that they're in uncompensation if their pH is still below 7.35, which is on the acid side, their CO2 is normal, but we have a decreased bicarb level, which is on the acid side. We're also going to see a potassium level of over 5.5 as the potassium moves out of the cells while hydrogen moves in. As the body moves into partially compensation as the lungs respond, we're still going to see a potassium level of less than 7.35, but our CO2 levels are now going to start falling below normal to put it in the basic end of it, and it's going to help offset the loss of bicarb, which is putting it in the acid level. And then we'll know that the patient is fully compensated when they have moved into the normal pH range. However, they still may be on the acidic side, 7.35 to 7.39, but they're within normal limits. We have a low CO2 level, which is compensating for the loss of the bicarb. In metabolic alkalosis, we have an excess loss of acid or an increased retention of base. Causes of this, excess loss of hydrochloric acid. So your patient can be persistently vomiting or they're getting a lot of gastric suctioning. Thiazide diuretics will help um, lose that, especially with prolonged diuretic therapy. Your patient can lose hydrogen ions. Retention of bicarbonate in creating an alkalotic situation can be a result of abuse of bicarbonate-based antacids, uh, hyperal, such as TPN. Infusion of multiple bud products, and then the reason for this is because citrate is a base type substance that's at, used as a preservative in blood products. So if the individual has to get multiple blood products, they're getting a lot of base. And Ringer's lactate due to the bicarb, acetate, and lactate in the Ringer's lactate. So signs and symptoms that are going to be exhibited by our metabolic alkalotic patient is we're going to have postural hypotension due to an extracellular volume deficit. And this deficit is usually due to vomiting or GI suctioning. We're going to see muscle weakness due to hypokalemia and severe dizziness along with tingling fingers and toes due to that decreased ionized calcium. The way we're going to manage this is we're going to give them fluids and electrolytes. It's usually 0.45% or 0.9% normal saline with potassium replacement to replace both the fluid and the potassium. And we're going to stop the use of antacids if that's the cause, and we're going to give them antiemetics so that they are no longer vomiting. So when we take a look at these individuals, we'll see that they are uncompensated. When we take a look at the pH, it is over 7.45, which is on the base end. The bicarb level is over 26, so it's very basic. And our CO2 levels are still within the 35 to 45 normal range. They have not started moving yet. We're also going to see a decreased potassium and that is decreased through increased renal losses and cellular movement into the cell. As the body moves into partially compensated, our arterial pH is going to be over 7.45. Our CO2 will be over 45 to try to offset some of the base. And again, our bicarb is elevated over 26 because that was our original problem to begin with. And finally, 
Our patient is going to be fully compensated when the pH is back within normal limits, but it's going to be on the basic side, so it will be 7.41 to 7.45. Our CO2 levels are going to be high to try to offset that base because the bicarbonate being over 26 is what is causing our problem. So that is the end of the lecture for here. So what we're going to be doing when we get into class is I will be bringing samples and we will be working through sample after sample and I will show you a trick on how to try to figure out whether or not you're in metabolic or respiratory acidosis or alkalosis. And then once you get this, then you'll have that. Thank you.